It's another edition of Time About the Movies, and today we're taking a look at the movies of May 22nd, 1998, Memorial Day weekend, of course. And uh, we have three movies to look at today, including not only the most overhyped movie of the summer of 1998, but one of the most hyped movies of the year. Um, we're going to start with that first because that was the big new release of the weekend. Now, I just want you to picture yourself back in July of 1997. Men in Black had just opened up in theaters. You're probably sitting in the theater, getting ready to watch Men in Black. The trailers are playing, and then the last trailer you see is this. I mean, what more do I need to say about that? That's where it all began. I mean, this had one of the biggest marketing campaigns, probably the biggest marketing campaign at that point in time. And, you know, you have Roland Emmerich coming off of Independence Day, which was one of the first movies that really kind of started this gigantic marketing campaign push. And they just pushed it to an incredible level with this film. Um Basically, Roland Emmerich said that you shouldn't use full body images or headshots or Godzilla during the marketing. And... It ended up being a smart move because every trailer that came out, they did a good job of hiding the monster, not showing it to you. You had to go see the movie to actually see the monster for yourself and see it in full, in full scale, on a full scale big screen. And you know what? Kudos to them. That was a big, big decision and it paid off big time. Like, that trailer was so popular that theaters actually began to advertise the fact that this movie was playing that Men in Black was, trailing, was playing this trailer in front of it. That's how big that is. I mean, we're talking about this is just a few months before The Phantom Menace was has had its trailer drop, and we'll eventually get to that one once we get to around November, because that's an interesting story in its own right. But but not only that, you had Taco Bell getting up, putting in $20 million for the bit media push on this. I mean, of course, you have the trailers where the Chihuahuas trying to trap the monster in a box. You had, Pete, you had toys, you had merchandise all over the place. I mean, uh, Sony Pictures, I mean, they went all out for this. I mean... On New Year's Day, on New Year's Eve, nineteen ninety seven, this is the trailer that they put out in front. It's right before the ball dropped. Are we ready to say goodbye to nineteen ninety seven? Are you ready, New York City? Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five. Nineteen ninety-eight, the year of Godzilla. Yeah, spoiler alert, nineteen ninety-eight really was not the year of Godzilla, which unfortunately brings me to um Yeah, let's talk about the movie itself because as much as I can say that the marketing campaign for this movie was brilliant, the marketing campaign for Independence Day was also brilliant as well, and look at what happened with that movie. That movie did not live up to the marketing, at least in my opinion it didn't. I mean, I know it made a ton of money, but um but yeah, at least that movie gave people something that they gave people what they wanted to see and maybe it didn't affect everybody, but most people liked Independence Day. Godzilla, not so much. This was a film that I think the reason why Roland Emmerich say don't put said don't put the monster in front of anything is because that when you see the monster in the movie, it looks terrible. It looks horrible. The visual effects in this movie look terrible. 
And if the visual effects were the worst thing about this movie, you could kind of let it slide, but the visual effects are the least of the problems of this movie, because this film, the story makes no sense whatsoever. The characters are badly written. Uh, just the, the characters are just poorly casted altogether. I mean, they spend more time on the human characters than Godzilla himself. Like, like the movie shouldn't be called Godzilla if Godzilla's only going to show up in a third of the movie. Like, on top of that, you have casting that just really does not make any sense in terms of, in terms of the people that they got in here. Like, Matthew Broderick is a capable actor. He's been in blockbusters before. John Renault's a rising star. He's best known for his work with the Just Visiting films. He's also in Luke Passant's Professional. But then you bring in all these different TV actors. Like, you have uh, Maria Patillo, who's been in a bunch of canceled 90s shows at the time. And then, not one, not two, but three different actors from The Simpsons in here. Hank Azaria, Harry Shearer, and Nancy Cartwright. For no reason whatsoever... And then there's Vicki Lewis from News Radio, and then there's Kevin Dunn. You've seen him in a ton of stuff. You've seen him on Seinfeld. Like, why the sitcom actors? Like, why couldn't you get any bigger names for this movie? I mean, with Brian Cranston and Godzilla, at least he proved that he was not a sitcom actor at that point. He had won Emmys for Breaking Bad. So he was more than a ke a ke an established actor when, he, when they put him in that movie. But here, it just doesn't make sense. And again, it would work fine if the characters were likable, but... You do not like any of these characters whatsoever. You hate Matthew Broderick's character because he looks too much like the character from J Jeff Goldblum's character from Independence Day and James Spader's character from Stargate. I mean, he has that same nerdy look to him like the, like Spader and J Goldblum had. You hate Audrey in this movie, Maria Patillo, because she's just trying to get back to, with her to top a list to just get further her career. I mean, she's not even hiding it. And, like, she comes off as a real bitch in this movie. Like, everybody comes off as just the most evil hatred people on the planet in this movie, and it's just not worth it. Like, they can't even do references right. Like, Michael Lerner in here plays Mayor Ebert, and he has his assistant Gene, you know, Cisco and Ebert. And it's it's sad when Cisco and Ebert's basically telling you, like, if you really wanted to make a good parody of with us in this, why not have the monster just step on us? I mean, like... I don't understand why they would have him in there if they're not going to do that. I mean, that would make a whole lot more sense here, but it just gets stupider and stupider as the movie goes on. Like, the big climax with the Madison Square Garden and Godzilla apparently can put, lay over 200 eggs because, I mean, he reproduces asexually, I guess, just like the monster, in, just like the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park. I mean, we'll never explain why, and the CG effects in there look horrible. If you watch the 4K version of this, this does not hold up at all. Like... It looks horrible. It as This whole movie looks horrible. And even with the great marketing campaign, I think it's so lazy sometimes. Like, I took a foot, I took a little bit of footage from one of the teasers. I want you to listen to this, and then I'm going to show you something else that came after this. That you might find a, a t the tune a little bit familiar, and you're going to see what it is after that. So take a look at this. Because when I think of Godzilla, I think Home Alone, and like, they didn't even try to hide it. Like, they're not even, they're literally not even trying to hide the fact that they are taking, taking the, the, is the first few notes of the Home Alone theme. I mean, it's like that clip Vanilla Ice did when he was talking about the differences between his song Ice Ice Baby and um, Under Pressure, and like, it's, a, it's like they implied that to this, to this thinking here. Like, if we change the notes around here, it'll be completely different, and um, Nope, people are still gonna figure it out that that's the same that's the same notes as Home Alone and and uh, yeah, but um, yeah, there's nothing good about this movie. I mean, it's a bad bad movie. Like everybody in this movie is so stupid. Everybody in this movie is so is so it's there's movie stupid and there's there's just stupid stupid and these people are just so stupid. Like when Godzilla attacks New York City. There are people who don't even realize that he's there. Like, there's a scene where a guy's in a truck, and he's listening to headphones. Like, I don't care how good your music is right now. If you don't feel the ground shaking, but this is a giant monster is coming down the city. Like, something is wrong with you, man. Like, so, like you're either death or, as I try to move up here about them, you're either death or you're just really obnoxious to what's going on here. And it happens way too many times with the people in this movie. Like, like if you hear a giant monster coming into the city 
Like, you should be able to hear the vibrations early on, but everybody in town, it's too little too late whenever they hear see it for the first time. It's just like, like, the stupidity levels of this movie get so ridiculous. And you know what Godzilla is not even the worst thing to destroy the city? The military is, because the military just keeps destroying buildings and just keeps getting, and just keeps destroying everything. And Godzilla's probably just sitting in the background going, Wow, I don't even need to do anything. Keep it up, guys. Keep it up. Like, why am I even here? It's just like, it's like, why are you even here? Like, even God, like I said, Godzilla's design looks terrible, and the movements are just so ridiculously bad. It's just, it's a mess. It's a mess on so many levels. This was supposed to be a huge new cash grab for Sony. They had sequels planned for this. They had a TV series that came out that same year, which coincidentally, the TV show actually turned out to be a lot better than this movie ever turned out to be. I mean, it wasn't a great show compared to Men in Black, but at least, at least it was something better than what this movie was trying to offer. But, um, yeah, it's just a disaster on so many levels. It's not even a good disaster. Like, this is one of those films that you look at it and you think, with them, and this is the film that I think a lot of people, including myself, realize that, wow, Roland Emmerich is probably the biggest con artist ever because he can pr bring to put this huge, brilliant marketing campaign behind these movies and... He j he knows he has to make these movies become. Mar is he has to he knows he has to make these movies sell because when the finished product comes out, it always looks and looks like it's a big disappointment. It's a, always a film that ends up looking as bad as it could be. I mean, he's done this throughout his entire career, even as of recently. I mean, Independence Day Resurgence pro had a decent marketing campaign to it, but who wants to see an Independence Day sequel twenty years later? And it's like. Like he did this with the day after tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow is probably his best movie in my opinion. Like it's the, like it's basically Independence Day again, but there's more moments in there that I enjoy compared to a lot of his other movies. Like Ten Thousand BC had a great marketing campaign. So did 2012. So did White House Down. So did Midway, and like after a while, it's just kind of like, you know, you could throw all he throws all you can throw as much money as you can to the marketing campaign for a movie, but if your movie is not is if you have to spend more money on the marketing to make your film look better, maybe you need to take a good look at yourself and realize that you're not as good as a filmmaker as you put yourself out to be. And I think a lot of people woke up with Godzilla and knew that if we're going to see another movie with this director, it's got to be something much better than the last mo the last couple of films he's done. And to his credit, the next movie he did was completely different from what he did before, and... Um, it turned out to be a lot better than I think most people would have thought, including myself, but um, we'll eventually get to that when we get to the Patreon 2000. But, um, but yeah, I know I've gone on a little, a lot about this, but Godzilla, you know, it was it just didn't work. And luckily, Warner Brothers and Legendary Pictures, when they did the MonsterVerse, they completely brought it back to what, they completely brought back what made Godzilla so special. They made a lot of great movies with the Godzilla with Godzilla and them, Godzilla, the 2014 one, King of the Monsters was a good one, Godzilla vs. Kong, we got a good Kong movie out of it, like, the MonsterVerse so far has been the most, is, honestly, the MonsterVerse has been more successful than the DC Cinematic Universe that they've been, the DC Universe, I mean, think about it, think about it, like, Warner Brothers has that and the Conjuring Universe, and they had the Lego Movie Universe for a while now, like, you didn't need the DC Universe, honestly, for, for Warner Bros. to have a successful multiverse. I mean, they had three right there, so... But that's a totally different subject altogether, but, uh... Yeah, Godzilla. What more can you say about it? It was one of the most overhyped movies of the year, and uh, it just did not live up to the potential that they had. So, when they said that this was the year of Godzilla, yeah, that wasn't true. That was not true at all. So, um... Now that I've gone off on that, let's go ahead and move on to a much better movie, and that is Terry Gilliam's Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Universal Pictures invites you to come to Las Vegas, where the people are friendly. You can't park your car here! It's not a reasonable place to park. You're on a sidewalk! You're on a sidewalk! The rooms are comfortable, <laughs> and the atmosphere is out of this world. <laughs> Johnny Depp. <laughs> Benicio Del Toro, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Get out of here! Rated R. Starts Friday, May 22nd in theaters everywhere. Of course, this is not the first time that Universal would do a movie that involves Hunter S. Thompson. Of course, uh, Bill Murray's Where the Buffalo Roam in 1980 was also met with mixed reception, but Bill Murray got a lot of good reviews for it, and he is really the best thing about that movie. The movie itself... Not quite as good, but Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas is a goddamn classic. I mean, this is a great, great movie. 
you have uh, Thompson, Johnny Depp's Hunter S. Thompson, and Benicio Del Toro as Raul Duke and Dr. Gonzo, respectively. And the film details the duo's journey through Las Vegas as the initial journalistic intentions devolve into an exploration of the city under the influence of psychoactive active substances. I mean, you see it in the trailer there, and it gets crazier and crazier from there. But then again, it, it is Terry Gilliam. And if you've seen Terry Gilliam's work, you know that this is exactly what you get from Terry Gilliam from this work with Monty Python, as well as stuff like Brazil and you know these other great movies that he's done, 12 Monkeys, The Fisher King, Baron Munchausen, I mean... It's as good of a Terry Gilliam film as you can get. I don't know why. I just keep slipping out of the chair for some reason. But, um, but uh, yeah, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas is a goddamn classic. And it is indeed a goddamn classic. Uh, Johnny Depp, pitch perfect as Hunter S. Thompson. Uh, actually, no, I'll take that back. That was not That's not Johnny Depp as Hunter S. Thompson. That is, uh, Johnny Depp is the one that's playing Raul Duke, and Benicio Del Toro is the one that's playing Dr. Gonzo. So I apologize for that. Um, I, is, my head's all over the place right now, but no, Johnny Depp as Raul Duke is really well done. It is a really good performance from him. It's probably my fa is my second favorite performance of his behind Ed Wood. I mean, this is such a great, great role for him. And him and Benicio Del Toro, the connection between them is just so good. And Johnny Depp just has so many quotable lines in there. It's hard not to to talk in the same length, the same dialect that he's using here. Like, for, it's like the scenes where he's like, when he goes to the hotel and they see, and the the patron is there, it's just like, what's the score here? And the, and she just turns into a lizard. And it's just like, Woo! like, like that's just that's just good fun stuff there. And not only do you have great performances from Depp and Del Toro, you have Tommy McGuire, Christina Ricci, Ellen Barkin, Gary Busey, Cameron Diaz, Catherine Hellman, Michael Jeter, Craig Bierko, Lyle Lovett, a uh, flea, you know, a lot of cameos in here. Debbie Reynolds. Uh, Christopher Maloney, Harry Dean Stanton, Penn Jillette, even Hunter S. Thompson himself shows up in this movie. Like The cast in this movie is just top-notch, and the movie is just so much fun. It's so hilarious. It's so well done. It's so over-the-top. I don't know what else to say about it. I love this movie to, to, to many, many ends. It's a great, great movie. If you have not seen Fear and Lonely in Las Vegas, seek this movie out. You will not be disappointed by it. And Mr. Thompson, I apologize for getting your characters wrong here. But your book inspired a really damn good movie, and I th and I appreciate that. Um, good job, Terry Gilliam. Good job, Danny Jeff. But um, with that said, let's go ahead and move on to the last film here. Let let's move on to um, a movie that has several of the same people that were in the that were in Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, and that is the opposite of sex. I don't have a heart of gold, and I don't grow one later. Everything was going great until she showed up. I knew you were trouble. Where's the money? She's the human tabloid. Well, that can't be good for the baby. Not only that, she's gonna smoke a cigarette after. Christina Ricci, Martin Donovan, Lisa Kudrow, Lyle Lovett, Johnny Galecki, and Ivan Sergei. The opposite of sex. Now playing. I'm starting to realize 1998 was a good year for Christina Ricci. Her breakout. This was kind of her breakout year because she had this movie. She had Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, and later in the year she would have. Buffalo 66, which has one of the greatest trailers you'll ever see. And uh, in this movie, she plays a 16-year-old Louisiana girl who moves in with her homosexual half-brother and immediately starts coming on to her sexual partner, finally forcing him into an affair in which she becomes pregnant. And the whole affair blows into a scandal exposing her school teacher, brother, and the true parent of the child is called into question as it revealed that there had been a series of lovers. So it's a very is heavy, heavy driven storyline. I mean, it takes a story that's fills with a lot of dark, dark elements here and makes a lighthearted comedy out of it and a good, fun, lighthearted comedy. I mean, it's a breakout role for Christina Ricci, like I said, but you have great performances by Ivan Sergei, Martin Donovan, Lisa Kudrow, Lyle Lovett, Johnny Galecki is in here, uh, Dan Bukatinsky, Leslie Grossman. I mean, just a really solid cast here. And his director, Don Ruse, is a pretty decent f filmmaker. I mean, he did write stuff like Single White Female, but and so not a whole lot of memorable stuff in terms of his early works, but he did write Marley and Me, and he also wrote stuff like Happy Endings and The Other Woman, not the Cameron Diaz one, the one that came five years, five years prior to that, and did web, and she created web, he created a Web Therapy with Lisa Kudrow, which was a great underrated show on Showtime, and uh, yeah, the movie overall, it's a very good film, it's a very solid film, 
that really the strongest thing about the movie is Christina Ricci, who I think really is the best thing about the movie. I mean, some, like I said, this was her breakout year, and this is one of those films that just makes you realize that, okay, she's not just Wednesday Adams. She's not just that girl from Casper. I mean, this is an actress that is really damn good, and she's really going to become one of those great actresses that we're going to be watching over the next couple of years. And while not quite as where we expected it to be, but she still is a pretty damn good actress even after all these years. And I really do like her in this movie a lot. The movie overall is great. Definitely check it out if you haven't seen it. The Opposite of Sex, really good movie. And so with that said, we wrap up another edition of Time About the Movies. When we meet next time, we'll have Sandra Bullock and Hope Floats. We also have I Got the Hookup, Matthew Perry and Chris Farley in, in Chris Farley's last movie, Almost Heroes. The Last Days of Disco, the new Whit Stillman movie, and also Insomnia, the one that, the movie that inspired the Christopher Nolan remake that came out four years later. So five movies to look at next time around. We'll delve into all of those next time. But until then, thank you very much for watching. And if you want to see more videos like this, please hit the place on the next page. Check out the previous episode. And also don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you want to see more videos like this on this channel. So with that said, I am off. I will see you guys next time. And until then, as always, take care.